Diana, what's up, Diana? Okay, first, let's kick it off, guys. Are there any questions you guys have at the moment? I want to make sure that I cover any questions you guys have about the changes um, that are going to affect this Saturday. Like, it's literally going to be happening this Saturday. It's already being practiced as well. I, I um, listed a property yesterday. I entered our uh, mine and Maori's listing. You can no longer enter commissions there, right? So it's already being practiced on the MLS level, but the rules go into effect officially as of Saturday, which is the 17th. Um, so first, just starting off with questions. What questions do you guys have about the changes when working with buyers or working with sellers? Um, anything like that? Let's kind of get some of those questions. I do. Out. Go ahead, uh, Diana. So like, let's say that I sign up front, tell my client, okay, you know, I'm I'm willing to help you for 3%. But then later on, I want to up it to four and a half. Can I amend the, what is it, BBA? Can I amend it? Yeah, so we we did cover that last week. So just um, I'll, I'll first say um, if you didn't watch the recording of the last training where we focused, that whole training was mainly on the buyer side of it. I would highly recommend you watch that one because we did cover that question on there. But I'll I'll go ahead and answer it. But oh, no, sure you, you know what? That. Yeah, that's fine. I will watch it. I saw it on like today on a chat and I thought, let me bring it up. So I am behind. I will admit that I won't ask again. Thanks, guys. Oh, no worries. I just want to make sure that everybody knows, you know, where it's at. Um, but to answer your question, if you sign an agreement at 3% um, and you later on want to change that, you would have to sign a new agreement or amend your agreement with your client, right? But you need to be careful um, because what they don't want is they don't want it, what they don't want is like you sign an agreement at 3% and then you find out this seller is offering 4% and then you're just trying to grab that extra commission, right? Like they don't, they want everyone to kind of be transparent, right? Like, Hey, this is my fee. Um, it's negotiated, not like you're changing it for every single property. And so if you're going to change going forward, like, Hey, it's a lot more work now. I'm going to charge you 4% now instead of three, just going forward 4% on any property, then you're going to want to amend your commission. Right. But just be careful of like where it seems like you're just trying to make a money grab. Right. I think that's where you're going to get in, where people are going to get in trouble if they're trying to like, you know, just play a little shady. Right. I don't know how else to say it, guys. Just don't be shady. That's the only way I could say it. Right. If an offer, I mean, this property listed, they're giving 4% concession. I mean, is it is it okay for me to, hey, hey, Mr. Seller, hey, Mr. Buyer? You know, we're going to make this offer. They are offering 4%. You know, can we go ahead and bend our agreement? I'd probably say no. You say no to that? Yeah. Because if that wasn't your commission, if your commission wasn't 3% or wasn't 4% to begin with, and you're just trying to be ad uh, take Without advantage, yeah, then I would say no. Now, if you had your agreement that said, hey, for any off-market property, I'm charging 4%. For any new construction, it's 3%. And for any resale, it's 25 and a half, And that was all spelled out in your initial yeah. agreement. Then you're being fully transparent with your client, right? And then they know what they're paying. But if you're just like, hey, that one, right? Like, I wouldn't do that, right? Because why wouldn't that extra concession go to the buyer? Yeah, right. To cover their closing costs. It is. It's a close. It's for their, for their closing Yeah. Costs. So no, I think that what, what I'm my takeaway is that just be as transparent as possible. And I like what you're saying when you're breaking it down, like if it's an off market or if it's out in Sacramento and I'm I'm here in San Jose, right? Then you can you can kind of illustrate all that on your on your commission. Yeah. Because I guess what the question you got to ask yourself is like if I ever got in trouble or the buyer wanted to make a claim and I went to court, can the buyer have an argument like, hey, you just saw this opportunity and you tried to grab it? That wasn't really your commission when we sat down it was three and then now all of a sudden you're trying to change it to four on this particular right. one like just ask yourself that question is that going to get you is that going to seem a little shady and, and i think you made a good point in the sense of this is a this is a credit to the buyer right so the buyer can actually allocate this to whatever closing cost they want yeah this isn't a commission to to the agent this is a credit to the buyer yeah and remember the 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 concessions are going to be negotiated for the deal um, you may have some circumstances where a seller says, Hey, I'm just letting everybody know this is what we're offering up front. Right. Maybe they're like, that's, our, that's their strategy of marketing their property. But I got a feeling that most concessions are going to be negotiated on a deal per deal base offer per offer basis. Right. Based on, because they're going to be looking what for the net they're for their net. Right. Like right. I may submit an offer and I'm asking for 3%. 
Mark makes the minimum offer. He's only asking for 2%, right? I don't know if the seller is just going to voluntarily give away free money. I don't know, right? Um, I'm not a lawyer, right? So just, you know, whoever's watching this video, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm also looking on the side of like, what do I think is going to get me in like trouble, right? Yeah. Like, how do I be more transparent for my client? I think that's what you got to ask. Because if you get a sense of what makes it a percent concession to a four percent credit for closing costs, that doesn't entitle the buyer's agent to that total four percent because the, the buyer can actually leverage that for other things of his closing costs. Well, remember, concessions doesn't mean commissions, right? And that's the important thing. Tabitha brought this up last time. Concessions, yeah. That's a credit, right? That doesn't mean that's your commission. So we got to distinguish those two. So, so. Yeah. Remember, remember, going back to what Enrique and Tabitha are saying, when they're offering for it, that's not a commission. They're offering four to the buyer. They're not offering four to you, right? They're no longer offering any commission. The seller's not going to offer any commission to a buyer's agent. They're going to be offering a credit, if anything, to the, to the buyer. Yeah, a concession is towards the buyer. Here's the credit. You do what you want with it. Now, if the buyer says, okay, I'm going to use that to pay my agent, his 3%. Now I got one left over. That's going to go towards my closing costs. That's up to the buyer, right? The the concession doesn't mean that that's your commission. Yeah. Two separate items. That's going to be a private matter depending on when I see it, right? We The, the concessions are always there regardless before this before this was uh, uh, yeah. given out, it made a wolf. Right? Yeah. So we're going to be looking at it from the seller's point of view. We're going to be looking at it more from a case, a case by case decision on what we're going to end up giving out. So you, you you probably won't know how much money is going to be given out. I really doubt that that's the way it's going to happen because if I have a listing, there's no way that I'm automatically going to put. I'm going to give you guys four four uh, concessions. It just doesn't make sense. That that doesn't have me. Uh, I don't have a fiduciary responsibility to my seller if I'm giving up that information. Was there a question? Because I, 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 I got a lot of stuff I got to cover, guys. We're not, we're not going to have enough time. If you have a question, then then bring me questions, right, that we're going to cover um, so that our training doesn't go somewhere else, right? So just remember, guys, uh, the question was, what document should you be using, the car form or the EXP ones? It's up to you, right? Like brokerages could have their own specific agreements that they came up with, which EXP did. They came up with their own specific ones. The reason why is they don't necessarily like the car ones because they're just really long and they're, they have a lot of other things in there. Um, so they try to just dumb it down and simplify it and make it shorter and easier to understand. Um, as I was reviewing the car listing agreement, you'll see in a second, like, it's really complicated, guys, compared to the EXP one. So I would recommend use, they're both okay to use. So that's the, that's the answer to the question. If you use CAR, EXP is going to accept it. If you use the EXP one, they're going to accept it. Now, which one do you use? I would use the one that you know better and you're able to explain better and you're versed in and it's not going to confuse the client, right? They both cover you, right? So that's, that's what I would recommend. Which one? Do you I'm going to use the EXP ones, just no. FYI, until... Like for the time being, and like it, remember, it's going to be a moving target, right? So I'm going to be using the EXP ones just because I think they're really simple. They I compared the two, and you'll see in a second, like they check off all the boxes. It's just like way less pages. It's to the point. 
it's not paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of like redundant information, right? Like the, the car listing agreement repeats itself so many times in there. It says the same thing over and over and over. And, and it's like, to me, that's like a, that's a nightmare for the client, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, which one should we train on? I'm going to touch on the car one today because I think there's certain things in there that are going to educate you on how the whole process works, but I'm still going to recommend you use the EXP ones as of right now. Now, will I change my, my mind in like a month or two as this starts to kind of roll out? Maybe, right? But for right now, what I don't want to happen is like we stop doing business because we don't know how to explain contracts, right? So what I want you guys to do is be armed with a simple and easy way to get the necessary points across and like we keep business moving, right? That's that's the way I'm looking at it. And so that's why I would recommend the EXP ones as a right? Um, okay, so now with this document submitted to the listing agent, this agreement. So when you sign this with, with your buyer, your EXP agreement, is this submitted to the listing agent with your offer? Uh, not necessarily, no. Unless they request it. But remember, if I'm a listing agent, I'm not the police of like, do you yeah, have yeah, an yeah, agreement? Yeah. If it's part of that, it has to be part of the contract you get to No, it's not part of the contract. Um, I mean, you would need to have like your standard like agency disclosures and your offer and all that stuff. But your agreement between you and your buyer, that's not necessarily like, it's like if I'm listing a house, do I submit my listing agreement to the buyer's agent? No, right? Because that's my contract with my client. That's your contract with your client, right? So- I don't, I don't think. The reason why I'm asking you guys is because I want you guys to understand that that EXP agreement is with you and your buyer, right? You don't have to worry if it's with another big box company because that doesn't concern them. Yeah. So that was my point. I wanted to make sure that, that, that that's. that's no. Nah. From what my understanding, you're not submitting your buyer broker to the listing agent. Kind of picking up on a question. If they had signed, it's so it gets to submit. So no. the, the, way, the way it's supposed to happen is whenever you get a purchase agreement signed, your listing agreement has your listing agreement has to be acknowledged. Then the purchase agreement has to be set together, right? Like let's say for example, I have agreement, you have your purchase agreement, right? And then I want to do a, a seller counter or a seller counter. No, 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 let's clarify the question. I don't think that's the question he's asking. I yeah. think the question is when when you get a buyer broker agreement signed with your client, what is what do you do with that paper? Yeah, you should hold on to it and keep it on file because if you do enter into contract, the EXP is going to require that as part of your file, right? Because you may sign like a hundred buyer broker agreements and you don't close all the deals. So are we going to like create a new file for every single one and submit them? Probably not. Um, now, internally, should we be tracking those, right? And uploading them? Like, hey, you went on appointment. Did you get the agreement signed? Yeah, I got that signed. Okay, upload the agreement so we have it on file. You know, this way, um, if anybody ever, if the client ever like tries to go sign with someone else, we're like, no, we have ours on file. So I think it's a good practice for us to maybe email those or send those in. Maybe we can come up with a specific email or a place where we just upload them and we have them on file. And that's really how you're going to be able to measure your conversion rate as well, right? How many appointments you set, how many you met, and how many you signed. So that's what I would recommend. I would recommend that we do. Yeah, we will. Huh? Um, peed forms? No, not necessarily. They kind of just floated around. We had to send the peed forms back to the listing agent. Okay, let's move forward, guys, because um, we're gonna, I want to make sure we cover this other stuff. Some of these questions, um, is part of what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk about. So we're kind of killing two birds at one stone right now. Um, so let's go into um the listing agreement, and we're gonna look at the car one versus the exp one, right? So what I want to preface first is guys the contract stuff i know this is not the sexy part of the business some people are going to tune out but please pay attention right because you need to know what's on there right i don't want this to be like oh i didn't know that was on there now i also want to just say that us going over this does not replace you printing this bad boy out and reading this thing up and down and knowing it like the back of your head right i'm going to touch on like the main points that you got to know but it's not my job to read it for you right just like it's not if you ever sign a contract, if your buyer signs a contract or your client does, they got to read the contract, right? Like you can never say, well, I didn't know because I didn't read it. That's your fault, right? That responsibility falls on you to read your contracts, right? 
Um, how do you get good and how do you understand these things? You got to read them over and over. Um, so by a show of hands, who has printed out or at least logged on and read the EXP buyer broker agreement, listing agreement, all the forms that they gave us? Okay. How about those of you guys watching from home? Um, not yet. Okay. So just if you haven't, guys, you are way behind. I'm just one of there's no way for me to say it, right? It's now if you're brand new, you just started that uh, Cody, you're excused, right? Um, but anybody else who's like been on the team already, if you haven't printed those out and you haven't read them at least a few times, you're behind. I'm just letting you know, right? Because come Saturday and you're barely reading it for the first time and you got a showing, yeah, we'll read a you're gonna be in trouble, we'll right? You're gonna be in trouble. Um, don't wait the night before to do your study for your test, right? Like <laughs> Uh, okay, let me share my screen real quick, guys. I want to be mindful of our time. This, um, keep in mind, this may have to extend into a, a second part of the of the training because it is a lot of stuff. I'm gonna try to just touch on the crucial points. Um, so first thing, EXP listing agreement. What I want to show you guys is the EXP one, and then I'm gonna show you the car one, and you're gonna see why I think you should use the EXP one. This is the EXP listing agreement. How do you find it? Um, we talked about this last time, but I'll just say it again. If you go into our tools page right? Our, we have this tools page with all our resources. You scroll down to EXP stuff and you'll see right here, the new EXP buyer and seller forms. When you click on that, it takes you to this FAQ page, which has a lot of the answers to your questions. It's a lot of the questions like, do I do this? Do I do that? Right? So you, it's also a good idea to read this whole thing, highlight it, get familiar with it. But the the links to all the forms are right here, all right? It's all in one spot that EXP created. Now let's look through the EXP listing agreement. Um, really quick guys, uh, the first part, property. This is pretty self-explanatory. You gotta enter the property information. So if you're listing the property at 123 Main Street, this is where you enter all the details, right? Um, the length of the agreement, okay? When does your contract start? When does it end? Pretty self-explanatory, right? Listing agreement starts today. It's a three-month agreement. So I'm going to put three months from now. Stop me, guys, if you need me to explain a little bit more. Agency disclosure. Um, there's an agency disclosure that you always sign, which is a separate disclosure. This is just letting them know, hey, that's a separate document, right? If I'm your buyer agent or if I'm your listing agent, that document is going to get signed separately. Your list price, right? What are you listing the property at? What's your price there? What's important here is um, you'll see all the contracts have now written this in there. The amount of real estate commission is not fixed. They're not set. They're negotiable, right? Like that's a term you're going to see on both contracts. Everything's negotiable. Everything's negotiable. Uh, listing broker compensation. So this is the important part for you to remember. Listing broker compensation is separate now from buyer compensation. That's the big change with the law. Before it was all lumped into one, you charge 6% or 5% or whatever you charge. And then you share part of that with the buyer side. That is no longer, right? Now it's like, hey, Mr. Seller, this is my compensation. And then buyer and their agent, they are gonna have the same conversation. That's their compensation. Those things are now separate, right? No longer commingled. Um, and so you're gonna put right here, if there's a flat fee you're charging for your listing, you'd put that there. If it's a percentage, which is typically what we do, you'll put that there, right? What's your percent that you're charging for the listing side, right? So it's also important that you understand, like if you were used to doing it the old way where you were charging like five or six or whatever and lumping it all together, like now figure out, okay, if I would have taken out the buyer side, how much am I charging on the listing side, right? And that's where you're going to go into strategy of what your fees are for the listing side, right? Um. Any questions on that part, guys, so far? Really quick. Um, before, you you would say you would charge, let's say, 6%, mm -hmm. right? And then you'd pay out 2.5% to the buyer side. So in this scenario, that ran the same, right? You're writing this. How would you write this? Okay. So remember, commissions are negotiable, right? So in a scenario, a made-up scenario where you were charging 6 and you were paying 2.5 to the buy side, that means the listing side made 3.5, right? So now on this document, I'm just going to write three and a half, not six anymore. 
And then that two and a half or whatever the buyer and their agent agree on, that's between them, right? That's just the way it is, right? And so when you're explaining this, right? Like you guys need to understand it and then you need to explain it the same way to your client. This is my fee, their fee is negotiable, right? And it's all gonna be a case by case. Yeah. No, no longer, right? And this right here, notice, EXP does not share commissions with the buyer's broker, right? And that was the big thing, they're separate, right? So yeah. um, just to reiterate, everything's separate right? You no longer are sharing your commission as a listing agent with the buyer side. Now, now I know this is kind of going in the weeds, but can, can the listing agent go and give a credit to the seller's closing? You step, you're going ahead. We're going to cover that in a second, right? Um, if the buyer is not represented, right? So this is another big term that you got to also remember, and I would write it down or pay attention, unrepresented buyer, the term unrepresented buyer. You're going to hear that a lot right? Unrepresented buyer means you have a listing and a buyer shows up. Hey, I want to buy this house. Hey, Mr. Buyer, do you have an agent? No, I don't have an agent. That means that buyer is unrepresented, right? They don't have an agreement. They're just walked in from the open house or they called you online. They don't have an agreement. Now there's two different things you can do. You can say, Hey, I can help you, you know, put the offer in, but I'm not your agent. But since I'm the listing agent, I could facilitate everything. You're still an unrepresented buyer. I still represent my seller. I don't represent you, but I can help you with the process, right? And for that, you can tell your seller, hey, if that scenario happens where an unrepresented buyer comes in, then I'm going to charge an extra fee because now it's extra work, right? And that's where you would put your fee here. So this is different from double ending or dual agency on a deal, right? There's unrepresented. Now, if you said, hey, Mr. Buyer, do you want me to represent you, right? Do you want me to be your agent and actually help you negotiate and do all that stuff? And I'd be acting as a dual agent. Well, then we got to sign an agreement of this is my compensation. This is how much you're going to pay me, right? So two different scenarios. So there's representing the buyer and being a dual agent, or there's just facilitating the transaction for an unrepresented buyer. Does that make sense, guys? So- so if they are if they are represented, then you're not going to be if you're going to be representing them, right? And you're can't you're the listing agent. You're no longer that 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 line does not even be need to be. You don't need to put anything on it. No, you always put something in there, right? You're always going to put something in there because you're covering your basis yeah. of hey, if for some reason an unrepresented buyer comes, this is how we're going to handle it, right? So, Mr. Seller, hey, look at there is high likely highly likely that an unrepresented buyer shows up either to the open house or finds us online or whatever it might be. And so the way I handle that is I'm going to represent you. I don't represent them, but if I have to facilitate all the paperwork, then I'm going to charge X commission or X percentage, right? I'm going to charge an additional, whatever, 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever it might be. You could even think about it as like what they would pay anyways to a buyer agent if they were going to pay towards the buyer side, right? And so I would put a fee in there. Um, strategically you can maybe make that less than what they would pay if they paid another agent so that's kind of like the in between like hey this is my fee if if i handle the paperwork it's it's a little bit more or if you go with an, another agent's offer then you're going to pay whatever you, is negotiated through that transaction right so let's say you... yeah to work with the unrepresented buyer yeah can you charge that buyer something else? No. You got to pick your path, right? You can't, you can't, yeah. Then now, now you're going to represent them and that's a different discussion. Now you sit down with them, do the console. Hey, this is why you're going to work with me. Hey, this is my buyer broker agreement. So it's either, it's either one or the other, right? Exactly, right? This is just unrepresented. The buyer can say, hey, I don't need you to be my agent, right? I just want to put the offer in. Okay, well, how are you going to put the offer in? Are you going to write it on your own contract? Like, are you going to, who's going to, are you going to be up to date on the, now I got to communicate with you to facilitate the transaction. There's more work now for me, right? So there is going to be a fee, you know, for my time. Does that cover it? Yeah. That's okay. Good. That's good. Um, so like um, in one, an example was like, we were charging 3% for the listing fee. And then 
we put in another one and a half percent just in case an unrepresented buyer comes in. Yeah, to facilitate the paperwork, right? That's a that's a scenario, right? So either way, my my listing fee is three percent. But if this buyer happens to come in, then I'm charging an additional one and a half to my seller to facilitate that part of the deal. But ultimately, guys, it's going to boil down to the net. Exactly. Right? Because that's just one offer that they're getting. They get multiple offers. Well, then that's that's going to be one net sheet based on Enrique representing the seller and representing the un or, or and doing the um, unrepresented buyer. Exactly. Right. So. Uh, if you guys didn't hear that, those of you guys watching at home is ultimately you always want to focus on the net. What's the net sales proceeds to your seller, right? How much are they going to walk away with, with that particular offer? And I think what's going to happen going forward, and this is a good practice is you're always going to want to be showing people net sheets, right? Because as this new territory comes in where everything is negotiable and it's all case by case, you may have one offer at a million and they're not asking for any concessions because the buyer is going to pay out of pocket. So the seller is netting a million basically, right? You may have an offer that's a million 25, but they're asking for a 3% credit. Now you got to do the math, right? That's a little bit less. But offer seems higher, but, but after the credit, it's actually a little bit lower, right? Or you may have this other unrepresented buyer that's offering a million, but then you're charging an extra one and a half percent to facilitate the paperwork. So that's where like, you got to show people the net, right? The net sheet is really going to be important. And you got to explain to your client, like, hey, let's not, let's not like think about all these what ifs. As we go, we're going to show you the offers and we're going to show you the net sheet. And then we're going to determine our next steps based off, you know, what each offer is coming in at net to you. Um, because just like a lot of you guys are asking the what ifs. Um, what happens when you have a lot of what ifs psychologically, like if you're always thinking, what if this, what if that, what is that? What does that create for the client? Confusion, uncertainty, fear, anxiety, they're worried, right? So your job is like, don't worry, Mr. Seller, right? Don't worry, like we're gonna cross that bridge together and you're not obligated to sign any offer. You're in control, right? So when we sit down, we're gonna break them all down for you, just like we would break down any multiple offer situation. We're going to show you the terms. We're going to show you how much you're going to walk away with. And then we're going to decide together which one is the best offer or which one do we counter or which one is stronger, right? All those different things. So let's not worry too much about that. Let's focus on getting your home ready, getting it on the market, right? Strategically, you know, prepping your home, pricing it right, all those things that are going to generate offers. And then we're going to have to tackle offers as they come, right? And that's the biggest thing, guys, right? Because this stuff right here, when you go in the weeds too much, you're just complicating the process for your seller. And your job is to take this complicated thing and make it easy, right? For them to digest and understand. That's a, that's how you become a better salesperson. Yeah. Um, since we can't put those pay out no more, like if your seller agrees to a, a 1.5 percent credit. Yeah. Um, can you put that on the MLS as far as like credits available? Um, I don't know yet if the MLS is going to allow you, that's actually, I tried to call, but they didn't answer the other day. Um, if they're going to allow you to put like in the private remarks, like concessions available, I got a feeling they're not, um, going to allow you to do that because you could just have that conversation on the phone, right? Like if I'm a buyer agent, I call a listing agent, Hey, is your buyer willing to, you know, work a credit? Even if I say yes, it really just depends on the offer. Right. So I feel like even like, like labeling them with that like it, like if your offer sucks then i'm not going to pay credit anyways right so yeah it's not going to get accepted so i feel like it's almost like a conversation that is just had for no reason there's no point to having that conversation to even post it right what you what you should do is submit your offer with your terms and make sure it's a competitive offer you know some kind of well there'd be a Put it up for a million. So I, I'll do it for nine hundred, right? That's basically when you put down seller's concession. It means that your seller's finally able to their own money, by the way. Yeah. So I think there's, yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at that, guys. And I think it's going to unfold after a while, because again, I, I'm looking at it from a point of view as a listing agent. I may put that one and a half on there, 
just so I can drive traffic, That's what I mean. right? Because there's a lot of buyers that are not going to be educated on what a net sheet is or not a buyer agent. So again, but that, but you can't really advertise that to the public. I love people say, "Hey, I'm allowed, I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to give you know one and a half percent consent." The, the only place you can the only place you can advertise something like that is going to be on your own personal website, right? Um, your own personal website. You can't put that on anything that touches the MLS, anything like that, because then they're then you're basically like saying I'm going to give a commission, but calling it a concession, or right? It a yeah. For yourself as an agent, you're not looking for your client. At that point. You're looking at yourself because you're trying to drive attention at that. Point. It doesn't. But that's not, that's yeah. not, that's not the way that I yeah. do. Yeah. People are putting in the private remarks. Yeah. yeah. They might, but, but remember, we don't know how it's going to fold out. Like some people might get, um, might get fined over that. Right. Guys, is that we, we have to remember that it is a buyer credit. How that buyer uses that to buy down their rates that they use that to pay, pay for something that that's why. Again, we're gonna get, it's all yeah. You know, okay. And I, I think I think for the sake of this, guys, yeah. is let's go back to the what the real the reality is everything's negotiable. Yeah. Right? So don't yeah. pigeonhole, don't pigeonhole your seller, don't pigeonhole the offer. Hey, hey, Mr. Buyer, you're asking your Mr. Buyer's agent, you're asking if there's a credit. I, I don't know. Send your offer in. I don't speak for the seller. The seller's gonna look at all offers and they're gonna determine which is the best offer for them. Send your offer, send your best offer with your best terms. Whatever you're asking for, it's going to be presented. That's all I got to say. Like, yeah. Yeah. We're over, over complicating it, guys, when we start going down those weeds, right? We're just making, we're, we're creating like scenarios that we don't have to create, right? So just go back to like, hey, it's all negotiable. Send me your best offer, right? Now, if you choose to ask for a 3% credit in your offer and that's your best offer, then that's that's what it is. I gotta present it, right? And we'll see. We'll negotiate. I can counter you. I can say, hey, I'm only offering one percent credit, or come up in your price if you want that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give up money. Don't give up your seller's money if you don't need to give up their money. Right. Let it come in. Um. And remember, guys, at the end of the day, the market is going to dictate what someone's really willing to pay on the property, right? What someone's willing to pay, the price and the terms that come with it, that's going to be dictated by supply and demand, right? And, and the area that you live in, right? All those different things that already dictate the market. So let's just not even like, let's not even go down the weeds with that, right? Just makes it more complicated. Um, okay. Um, buyer list. So if upon expiration, so this is important. This was in the, this was in the, uh, original listing agreement as well. All this means is like, if the listing agreement is canceled or expired, and then a buyer that came in that wrote an offer comes back later on and like makes an offer, like you still get paid on that, right? So that's not new. That's always been around. We just never practiced it, right? It's always been in the contract, right? It's just a lot of people leave it blank. So I would encourage you to put at a term in there. Cause let's say like you had their house on the market, uh, Dan brings the buyer, the seller chooses not to take that buyer. And then your listing agreement expires. And then you find out a month later that Dan came back directly to the seller and then the buyer, the seller accepted his offer, right? Are you gonna, right? And so if you don't put in a, if you don't put in a day, a day period in there and that happens, like you're out of, you're out of luck. I'd put like 90 days, 120 days. I'd put something, yeah. Why did you make a face? This is what what's long though. Long is that's subject to like whatever you think is long, right? Yeah. Is that long compared to 10 years? No, it's short, right? <laughs> so that's what I'm saying is don't just you gotta yeah, don't overthink it. Protect yourself, right? You know, so yeah, like if you marketed the property, that buyer came in and then like they didn't go with the offer because of your efforts and you spent money on marketing and then they come back two months later and then you find out they close the deal with that same agent and cut you out. I don't care if it's two months, three months, six months, whatever. Like I'm, I need to get paid. Right. I mean, you'll see it close on the MLS and you'll see who the agent was, right? Like there's ways to find out. You can look up the title and see who the buyer was. 
No, procuring cause no longer stays in effect. So there's no such thing as procuring cause anymore. Procuring cause is now gone because of these new rules, right? Because if if you go show the property to a buyer, right? You go show the property to a buyer and they never had an agreement with you. And then they have an agreement with my and my rights, the offer, and they have a signed agreement. You're not the procuring cause. Like you didn't secure your position. So that's why you need, you can't be out there riding dirty, showing people homes with no contract, right? That's your fault. The procuring cause thing back in the day was like, hey, I showed them the contract, the, the house. I went over disclosures. I did all this. And then they wrote the offer with their cousin. And then you had an argument. That is off the table now. Because now everyone has an agreement signed, right? Right? So that everyone has an agreement signed. Um, all right, let's move it. Let's move forward, guys. Seller concessions, right? Back to what we already said. Seller concessions are not required by law. Any amount of seller concession is negotiable, right? And this, all this does is just explains that it's negotiable. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole again. We already beat that one into a pulp. Authorization to promote, right? So this is basically, you're probably going to check all these boxes. Like we can put it on our EXP site. We're going to put it on the MLS. We're going to put a for sale sign. We're going to do photos, video, right? We're going to probably check all those boxes. And then broker is or is not authorized to disclose the existence of offers. That's another thing too. So before it was like, some agents would tell you about what offers they had, some listing agents. Like I'm pretty open. Like I'll tell hey, I got five offers, right? Um, but there may be some sellers that says, don't tell anybody anything. Just have them send their offer in. Keep our cards like really close. There's pros and cons to that. I think I like telling people I have offers because that, to me that creates competition. But you know how there's some agents like, oh, I can't tell you nothing. My lips are sealed, right? Send your offer in. Um I don't know. So this is where they have the option to say you are authorized or not authorized. I'm on a Zoom. What was that? Yeah, fish talk. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's another training piece on, on the pros and cons. Of yeah, pros and cons. I'm not, yeah, we won't get too into it, but there is an option right there to check that box. I would recommend checking is. Yeah. Now you can have this all checked off, right? And filled out for your client and then you can go through it and if they're in agreement, they sign it, right? Um, showing showing an access, basically, basically we authorize a lockbox or we don't, that's all standard. Uh, no, so, so guys, just to stay on track, we're going over the EXP listing agreement. This is what they have, right? So other stuff that was on different contracts before that has nothing to do with this one. This is the, this is EXP's contract, right? Um, right. Um, so this is basically does, do they authorize you to put a lockbox on the property? That's all that means. Um, broker services. Uh, let me go through this and then save your question. Okay. Broker services, uh, Basically, just a description of what the broker is going to do, right? Market the property, due diligence, all that stuff. Seller commitment. Seller understands and commits to, um, you know, provide all the documents, disclose everything, blah, blah, blah. Fixtures, anything that's included or not included with the, with the property. That's pretty standard. Um, recordings at the property. If the seller has audio or video recording system, um, they're supposed to... I guess, tell you, you're not supposed to record people without their, without their permission, I guess, right? I think that's just letting them know. Cancellation, the agreement may be canceled upon mutual agreement. So this is an exclusive agreement. If they want to cancel the agreement, you guys would have to both agree to it. Um, basically says the law governs it. Fair housing, we can't discriminate people. Uh, FERPTA, that's a disclosure you sign. I'm not going to really go into that. Potentially competing sellers and buyers, the broker may represent or take listings on similar types of properties. They may also represent buyers looking for properties. This is like the disclosure regarding like multiple, multiple properties, multiple buyers and dual agency. Electronic signatures, that's pretty self-explanatory. Assignment, you can't assign this to somebody else, like sign an agreement, assign it to another broker. Cyber protection, I'm not going to go into that. Any additional terms or conditions. So if there's anything you want to put in here, like, the seller is going to pay this extra fee or the seller is paying for the reports or you're paying for staging or whatever you want to outline in there. That's any other terms of part of the, the uh, agreement. You're going to write those there. And that's pretty much it guys. Like it's super condensed, super simple. 
um, four page agreement. Like all of you guys in this office can read through this, memorize it a few times, practice it, and you guys can go out there and sign listings. What was your question, Blanca? Um, so no, because this is the listing agreement, right? So the listing agreement only needs to be accepted by your broker, right? On the buy side, we're still using car purchase agreements. That doesn't change. But our buyer broker agreement, the agreement between you and your client, we have the EXP one or we have the car one, right? So at no point would the other agency even have that document, right? That's between you and your client. So as long as your broker accepts your agreement, then you're fine, right? Um, you know, like in the past too, there's scenarios where they would send us something like Keller Williams. Yeah. They would send us this extra disclosure and they would want your buyer to sign it. And you're like, well, like we don't need to sign that. That's your guys' own agreement. Like we don't need to sign that. Melissa would say, no, we don't sign that. That's not required, you know? And so that's, in that scenario, it's, it just depends if, the, if they're in agreement with it or not. But for all of these agreements that we're talking about, these are agreements between you and your client, not necessarily you and the other agency, right? Yeah. EXP is fine with either of them. Yeah, we covered that in, in the beginning. But I, my advice to you is to use the one that's the easiest to explain, that's not gonna create all this like confusion um, because I'm going to go through, we don't have that much time guys, but I'm going to just pull up like the car agreement, the car listing agreement, right? It's 19 pages because they have all the disclosures together. The actual agreement itself is only seven pages, the actual listing part of it. But then they added all these other disclosures and it's like this big old booklet, right? And so I'm even thinking like, even as experienced as I am to go in there and explain this correctly, like it's going to be difficult, right? Like I'm going to have to do this a lot of times because it does say it repeats a lot of stuff and it does like get into like the weeds a little bit, um, which is to me is really going to make the sale harder in my opinion, right? So if my broker accepts this agreement, that's all I need to be concerned with, right? Because our duty is to our broker, right? Our, our broker is who is responsible for us. Um, and remember the brokers have their own attorneys who write these contracts, right? So if your worry is like, well, it's not the car one, all the car one was just written by different attorneys. The broke REXP is like one of the biggest companies in the U S hires their own attorneys to write their own version. Right. And so. Exactly. Well, and so you're protected, right? So it's it's you're protected and it's easy to present. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole contract, guys. I'm only going to go over a few things that I've highlighted, um, because this it's going to confuse the heck out of you. Uh, on the page one, the part about compensation. So this is C right here. Let's see. Okay. This a little bit bigger. So this section C right here is the equivalent to where you write all the compensation stuff, right? So compensation to seller's broker on seller side of transaction. This is where you would put your percentage, your flat fee, whatever your compensation is that you're charging your seller. You'd write that there. Um, additional compensation to seller's broker if buyer is unrepresented. We talked about unrepresented buyers. They have a section in here where you would put an additional fee if you're charging for an unrepresented buyer, right? Continuation of right to compensation. This is where after, if the listing expires and that buyer comes back and buys the property and how many days, you know, you have so that you're covered, right? It's the same thing that was in the other contract. It's right here as well. Um, seller's obligation to pay previous brokers. This is like, maybe if they have like another agreement with some other broker that is, they got to get paid or something, they would have to let you know right here. Um, that's the main thing on page one that I see. And it's pretty much equivalent on the EXP one, right? Except it's just condensed and doesn't have a lot of the extra stuff. Um, on page two, 
uh, items F2 and F3. This is something that I saw that's new on this, on this contract is they talk about buyer supplemental offer letters. So basically this is saying like when they submit an offer and they write a letter to the seller, you know, they write like, sometimes you write a letter, you put the picture and all that stuff to try to influence the seller. This is basically saying if the seller instructs you to present those letters or to not present those letters. Some sellers may be like, hey, I don't want to know who they are, right? Just who's giving me the best offer? Um, but then it also, what you don't want is you don't want to get into a territory where people might discriminate because they might see like the race of the family or whatever that might be or the jobs that they have. Like some people like it's out there, guys, right? Like it could be like, oh, you can get yourself into where like a discriminatory situation because they've now looked at, okay, family A, family B, family C. And like, I like that family more because they're Mexican, right? You're not supposed to do that. So yeah, but this is just, all they did is they added this to the contract now for the seller to decide if they want to see those or not, right? Um, yeah. So that's the only thing I see that's different. Now, the whole compensation to broker, there's a whole compensation to broker section on this page, number four. This is basically where it goes into details of like, you know, what I just explained, like an unrepresented buyer, all these different things. But what I don't like about this, guys, is it's so long and it's so redundant and it actually repeats itself like in another part of the, the contract. It's like you have all these extra pages that say the same thing. And so to me, it's just like it's it's complicated. Right. But they talk about. Um, they talk about compensation to broker, right? So whatever is on page one, optional additional compensation for unrepresented buyers. Like we already talked about that on page one. Why are you putting it on page two again, right? That's kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah. But what I'm gonna show you in a second is our listing presentation where we're already gonna talk about that, right? Um, compensation, transaction or seller default, right? Like. If during the listing period, any extension broker and or seller, any other person um, completes the transaction, then I'm entitled to compensation. Okay, well, yeah, of course. That's kind of like given. A continuation or right of compensation for the procured buyer. Um, it kind of just talks about like the same thing. Like after the listing term, if that buyer comes back, it pretty much explains that. If the seller interferes with the listing, right? Can you try to charge them a commission still? Like if they block the sale from happening. That's what I'm saying. Like, do you really need to talk about that? Like on the, right. If you are going to present this, you need to go line to line. You need to go. Yeah. Over Cause it's a lot of legal jargon. Um. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, you need to know what this thing means, guys. You need to read this a lot. You need to be able to explain every single line, like if you're going to use the car one. I just think that's that's why even me, I like some of it's confusing for me, guys. I'm not going to lie. Uh, buyer breach and seller recovery of damages. What it's doing is it's putting all these what-if scenarios, all these what-if scenarios. And what we said in the beginning was what happens when you go over too many what-if scenarios? What does that do for the client? Creates confusion, hurdles anxiety makes them second guess. Do I really want to sell the house? Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Uh, I think that's where you, it, it can cause more trouble than it does uh, benefit. Um, it also says right here, maximum listing periods. This is something that I didn't see before. It's saying the maximum listing agreement you can have is 24 months, right? Two years is the maximum length for a listing agreement unless it's a corporation LLC or partnership. So if it's an entity, then it can be like maybe unlimited, I guess that restriction doesn't apply. But if it's for just a regular client, single family dwelling, a regular seller, 24 months is the max term you can do. Um, presentation of offers. I can tell some of you guys are even getting bored. It's just too much right now. Um, right here, what I highlighted, strategies affecting delayed offers and broker compensation. It's like going into the weeds of like, what's the best strategy for when should you accept offers? Do you have an offer due date? All these different things. I just don't know if that's stuff you talk about in the contract right there. I think you talk about that in your presentation, right? 
part of your marketing. Um, but remember though, guys, a lot of this is creating the what ifs. Like what if you don't get any offers and you spent all this time talking about an offer due date? No, you're going to talk. I know, but I'm saying, do you want to go like into so much depth of all of these things? That's, that's my thing is keep it simple. That's basically what I'm trying to get at. I'd keep it simple. Um, uh, let me see. There's only, there's only like one or two more things. Um, sorry guys, before I lose you guys to the weeds, it talks again about unrepresented buyers again. It's the third time on the contract it talks, it talks about unrepresented buyers and how those are handled. Um, that's it. Those are the only changes. Those are the main changes that I see on the, between the old listing agreement and the new one is they added this stuff. Now, another thing they added, right, is they added a whole two-page disclosure called Broker Compensation Advisory. I'm not going to go through that whole thing, but it's now another disclosure where basically everything that we've already talked about today and like in our presentation they spell it out in this advisory, right? Yeah. They talk about compensations negotiable, unrepresented buyers again, right? Um, can you do a dual agency? Compensations are negotiable again, written agreements, advantages, pros, cons. So it's up to you guys, right? If you want to use that. Those are the two main things that I see, right? That are different. Is those changes that they added to the contract. Um, and then this new additional buyer broker compensation advisory that kind of just explains everything. Now, the reason I brought it up here for training is because you should know this, right? So it's this is good, I think, for you guys to be able to read through this and understand it all. And then how do I take all that information and just explain it really easily to my client, right? which is usually what I do anyways in my listing agreements anyways. I don't go line for line. I say, hey, basically, that's what this means. Basically, that's what this means. Let me take all of this and summarize it for you. Do you have any questions on it? If you have any questions, let's discuss it. Okay, are you guys good to go? Okay, let's go to the next page, right? That's the way I present my, my agreements, right? I don't go line for line because, like I said, if you read these things, like it can become really scary. <laughs> Um, no, not necessarily because remember this is, these are the car forms, right? EXP is saying that their listing agreement already covers all that. So yeah. We don't know that yet. Right. And that's for, that's for us to find out. Right. That's for us to find out. Guy that as well. Yeah. Now, like is. EXP going to say, okay, you can sign our listing agreement, but then you got to have these other disclosures with it. I don't know. Right. Um, once again, it's all of these things are meant to like protect and advise, but the person who's taking the risk is who? It's the broker. So if the broker says, Hey, we're okay with you guys doing business, as long as they, you go over this one and this one and they sign it and you explained it, we're okay. We're confident that we're covered with that. Right. That's up to the, that's up to the broker to decide. Right. Cause at the end of the day, it falls back on the broker. Right. And trust me guys, the broker has done their, their homework, right? Like they, there's 90,000 over almost a hundred thousand agents in EXP. They've, they've done yeah, their homework, different states, different, different, states, different, states, different things like that. Right. Okay. Can you guys bear with me for like another five, 10 minutes? Cause I want to just go through the changes in our listening agreement. Right. And I'll try to run through this quick. Um, so what I did to our listing agreement, those of you guys that are familiar with our listing agreement, um, if you haven't, it's in, you can go to the tool page and find a shortcut to there. If you want to find this and customize it, you got to log into our Canva, right? There's a team Canva. Don't log in under your own personal Canva. Log into our team account. You guys have all have the login. It's on our tools page as well. The login is there at the bottom, the, the credentials. And then you're going to go to brand templates. When you go to brand templates, you'll see right here, PRG listing presentation. You click on it and it's going to ask you 
if you want to use it and when you click use it'll make a copy for you it won't mess with the original one it'll make a copy in the copy you can edit the copy right that's the way all of our templates work and then so yeah your only option is to use it right it won't let you like edit the original because that's the settings that i put so it's a view only it makes the copy when you click use now that one you can go in there and customize the only thing you're really going to customize guys is just your photo and your information right here everything else is like all kind of like the standard stuff like we have like in our buyer presentation it's a template right so there's no reason for you to come and start changing the whole entire thing if you want to spend time and you're good at canva and you want to change the colors or brand it to you that's cool too but the content itself is meant to be that you could just memorize this and it takes you through this, just the same way we do the buyer presentation. This is just the listing version of it. Um, so the change, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I'm gonna go through the changes that I added. And so what I added is this part on the table of contents, what we will cover is how commissions are handled, right? And then when you scroll down, I just listed the talking points. So that's the addition that I made to cover us with this stuff so that you make sure you cover it in your presentation. And so how commissions are handled, these are the four talking points, understanding the new NAR rules, right? Seller agent versus buyer agent commission, how seller concessions work in a transaction and how unrepresented buyers are handled, right? Because remember when I'm doing my listing presentation, I'm not pulling out the contract first, I'm doing my presentation first, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover everything they need to know so that when I get to the contract, all I do is just breeze to the contract. Hey, remember that thing we talked about? Yeah, that's right there, right? There's, this is like, there's a difference between the contract and like how you sell it, right? The sales aspect of it, right? And so all I did was just add one slide where this is your chance to educate the client on what's going on. Hey, Mr. Client, remember the script we did? Has anybody informed you on the new NAR rules that just went into play? That's the same script that we do on the phone. Hey, Mr. Zillow flex deal, right? Has anybody told you about the new NAR rules, right? And then I'm just gonna tell them my script. Hey, basically as of the 17th, you know, this is the way commissions are handled. You know, buyer agents need to have their own. This is how it was handled before, right? We would share part of the commission. We no longer do that. Now, this is just our agreement of what we charge. The buyer agent is gonna charge their commission to their client. It's all negotiable, right? Keep it simple. Today, before our, right before our meeting. Right. As I was prepping for, as I was prepping for our um, thing. Right. So as of right now, this is now the new template. Um, seller agent versus buyer agent commission, Mr. Seller. Right. So the way it works now is as a listing agent, I'm going to have a compensation agreement with you for my services. The buyer is going to have their own compensation agreement for their services. Right. And the buyer agent will be responsible for compensating their client or the client will be responsible for compensating their agent, right? Now that can also be negotiated through the deal. And that leads us to seller concessions. So what seller concessions are, Mr. Client, seller concessions is if you choose or it's negotiated that you're gonna give a credit back towards the buyer side. Now, if you, if you do that, they can use that to pay their agent. They can use that for closing costs. It's all gonna be negotiable. So an example, and I'd give them an example. Client submits an offer for a million bucks, but they're asking for a 3% concession. They can use that to pay their agent. They can use that for their closing costs. And what we're going to look at, Mr. Buy Mr. Seller, is as the offers come in, we're going to compare the offers and see who has the best price, the best terms, and who's at the end of the day, after all concessions, who gives you the highest net, right? And we're going to focus on the net. And then from there, we'll decide how we move forward. Do we counter offer? Do we accept an offer? What do we do, right? Just keeping it very simple, right? Um, unrepresented buyers, how are those handled? So Mr. Seller, there may be some situations where a buyer comes in and they don't have an agent and they want us to help them write the offer, right? So they would be considered an unrepresented buyer. So we can still do all the paperwork. You know, there's gonna be more work because we have to do all the paperwork. We would charge an, we would charge an additional fee, you know, to the seller but we represent you, we don't represent them. All we're doing is helping make the deal happen, right? Now, if they wanna go hire their own agent, that's a different situation, right? But if they just wanna get the offer in and they want us to do the process and get the paperwork and navigate the whole back and forth and all that stuff, then that's where an unrepresented uh, buyer is, is, comes into play. 
Um, and of course, like I said, Mr. Seller, we're going to go through all the offers. We're going to look at the net. We're going to compare and contrast, and we're going to decide which is the best offer for you. The net. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to reiterate, you're, you're not, in, you know, you're not obligated to accept an offer. We're going to go through those case by case. My job is to protect you. My job is to make sure you get the best deal, the best price, the best terms, make the smoothest process, make sure it closes, right? And make sure you walk away with the, with the biggest check possible at the end of this deal. Okay, what questions do you have, Mr. Seller? Does you could you understand kind of how compensation works, how commission works? What other question would a client ask you at that point if you explained it all? Besides, like, oh, well, what if this? Some like scenarios, right? But is there any like fundamental piece that you would have to explain? Right? If you just have this conversation, right, and keep it simple, the seller's going to go, okay, that makes sense, right? Okay, I see how it works. Try to make it simple, guys. Um, so that's the, only, that's the change I made. And then the other change that I made was on the next page, which choose your level of service. So all we did was I just changed um, the commissions at the bottom because now these are just listing side commissions. So I took away like, you know, the five, the six, the seven or whatever that was lumping everything together. And now I'm just selling my services. That's it. Just on the listing side. And you can edit these, right? You can, if, if you don't want to charge that, you can charge more, less, whatever you want to do. Um, so you can edit that. Or if, um, if you're going to edit that case by case, right? Because like you're going on a listing appointment, you know, they're competing, you're competing with three other listing agents and it's probably going to come down to commissions. Maybe you might want to be a little more aggressive on that. Right. So it's up to you. Or maybe you want to take this and then you negotiate, you can cross it out. Okay, hey, I'll give you the gold, but we'll do it for three or whatever that might be. That's up to you guys, right? But remember, commissions are negotiable, right? But I wanna arm you guys with the tools, the resources, the guides, the presentations, right? The training so that you can go out there and you can figure out what's gonna be the best for the seller, right? You can win them over, you can show their value. Those are the only changes that we made guys to the, to the listing presentation. And that's going to cover us. I don't want anybody to overcomplicate this thing. Questions, guys. Questions on the listing presentation. My question to you guys is after kind of like seeing this stuff, um, does anybody feel a little more confident now? Like, hey, it's not, it's not that big of a deal, right? It's just more of just practicing, memorizing it a bit. Get good at listening. So I think that that's awesome. I don't know if everyone knew that it's a city in Chamba like that, but definitely pull that out. I do have a question though. Sure. So now uh going back to like Tabitha, Tabitha was doing an open house yesterday. So now when when buyers come in, what is the practice for when you're hosting an open house? Buyer comes in, how does that look? Uh so for my understanding is you can host an open house because you're representing your seller. So you're marketing the property for your seller. You could have buyers come in. Even if they have an agent, they can still come in, right? Because you're not representing them. You represent your seller. I'm opening this doors to get my, pro my seller's property sold. Now you can ask the question when they come in, hey, are you guys working with any agent exclusively, right? Or do you guys have a signed agreement with an agent? The same way that you guys would before would say like, hey, you're working with an agent. It's the same thing. Now you're just saying, hey, you have a signed agreement with an agent. That's the only difference, right? The buyer can't walk in on their own. They don't need to have an agent. They don't, they don't need to have, have an have agent. In yeah. order for you as a buyer's agent, if you're going to show a property, you need to have a relationship or a story. Exactly. Uh, if, if, and you still ask for, like, let's just sign in with contact people with the other side. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, if that's a practice that you do for your, for your sellers, right? The question was, can you still ask them or require them to sign in? Yeah, of course you can. Because, like, hey, like, my seller wants to know who came in their house. Whether you have an agent or not, doesn't mean you have to do business with me, but we want to know who came in. Because I may call them, like, even if they have an agent, hey, 
Mr. John Smith, are you guys going to submit an offer? Hey, did you talk to your agent about the property? Who's your agent? I might know them. And I might call their agent. Hey, man, looks like your clients were interested. You guys are going to make an offer. That's me trying to get my client, my seller's property sold. And if they don't have an agent, then of course, yeah, then it's going to be fair game. But you're trying to win them over and trying to see if you can retain them as a client. Yeah. And same practice. The only thing is you just need to ask if they have a signed agreement. Because if they have a signed agreement, then you need to tread carefully, right? If they have a signed agreement, you're over here trying to poach them like, hey, why don't you work with me, right? Like that. No, that's you're getting in trouble for that, right? Right. Um, if they don't have a signed agreement, then um, it's open game just like it always was, right? Just, just to try to win them over. Um, now you can also like tell them like, Hey, you know, you don't, you don't have an agent, right? So, you know, just be careful on what you say, because anything you say can be used against you in negotiations. Right. Uh, so I would advise you probably, you know, see, maybe let's sit down and see if it makes sense for you to retain us and have us represent you so we can represent your best interest. Are you able to host open houses even if it's not your listing? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, because that might be like in the gray area a little bit, right? Because you're not representing your seller, but maybe you're just there for unrepresented buyers. I don't know. If it's the same brokerage, yeah, right? If you're represent, If you're hosting an open house for your brokerage, I think that kind of covers you, even if it's not your listing, but it's the same brokerage because you fall under like the same umbrella. If it's for another brokerage, I don't know. Tabitha's saying, yes, you can. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, that's a good question, guys. I'm, I'll email um, our broker and ask them. Um, the other thing I want to point you guys to is you guys know you guys can email the broker anytime, right? You can, uh, you can go on the EXP world and you can walk into their office virtually, or you can just email them. The email is like, I can send it in Slack. It's like California.exp, whatever. And you email them and they'll respond to you. There's like multiple brokers on duty and they usually respond pretty fast. So if you have a question, Hey, are we allowed to do this? They'll respond to you. And share that chat. Yeah, that was a question that came up on one of the EXP presentations of if you're using like a showing agent. And so I think if the agreement is with you or your brokerage or you and your team, right? Maybe on your agreement, you can, you're going to put team, right? Team PRG, then that kind of covers, that agreement kind of covers everybody, right? Because let's say, for example, you have a client and then like Mark is helping you show them, like, are they going to have to sign a buyer broker with Mark and you? I don't think so. Or because you guys are both on the same team, both under the same brokerage umbrella, I think you're I think you're covered from my understanding. But that's a good that's another good question. And I'll I'll clarify that as well. But if you want to protect your if you want to just cover your cover yourself when you're signing, you can put team, right? Put your name and team. So agent, my and anyone on team PRG or whatever, right? Or anyone on PRG real estate at exp. Right, because we do sometimes help each other show property, 100%. right? Um, what, what, yeah, you got, I just want to add in there, guys. If you don't know the settlement statement, start spending time on it. That was one of my takeaways: is that you're going to have to know your settlement statement because we got we have to anticipate that some of these listing agents may not know their settlement statement. So you may need to break down your offer and illustrate them, illustrate that to them on what what their client is actually getting. Right. So know your and, and if you guys, you guys, there's a there's a Chicago title app that can create the settlement statement for you. Yeah. Well, and settlement statements that's net sheet, right? Some of you guys know it as net sheet. Lenders know it as settlement statement. But the net sheet, right? If you're going to be working with sellers, and you present your offer, you may want to present it with the net sheet, right? Or you may want to make sure that age because let's say like let's say the listing agent, it's like they're a rookie, right? Like it's their first listing and like their parents' house because their parents just gave them the listing 
and they don't really know like how offers and concessions and all that work. And so they may like see a higher offer. They're offering 1.1, but like, yeah, there's a 3% concession, right? Where I'm offering 1.1 with no concession, right? Or I'm offering 1.09 with no concession. Your offer is actually better, but they don't know how to, exp they don't know that because they don't know net sheets and then they don't understand that, right? And and I think the listening is going to appreciate if you did send in that net sheet. They yeah. appreciate the value. You're just being truly transparent and that's easy for them to illustrate to their to their applicants. Yeah. And what you can do is even put that in your um, offer summary, right? When you're sending your email, hey guys, we're submitting, you know, 1.1 million, no contingencies. We're asking for a 3% concession, which means your client, our net, our offer is a net of this, right? So 1.1 minus 3%, our net offer is, is that. Just to spell it like clear, like let's like, right? Because there may be that one agent like that just there's doesn't get it. Like it. Doesn't get it. Kind of yeah. right now, right? And they just, listing agents. They're not all and you guys see some of the listing agents, they just push their client to go with the highest offer. Right. And like not really looking at the terms, you know? So don't, don't think like, Hey, you're going to get a counter on every offer. Like you got to make sure like it's explained, it's communicated, right. You got to be all, all over it. Um, that's all I got today, guys. We will continue to do this, uh, to go over this. Um, I just want to reiterate you've got to print these things out and you have to role play them, right? Um, this gives you a foundational understanding, but for you to master this is print the listing presentation out, print the contract out, practice it on each other, right? Practice it on yourself, record yourself, you know, saying it, right? Make sure you know how to explain it. That's how you're going to get good. And you don't want to practice on your client, guys. Don't practice on your client because all it takes is like, I've already practiced a lot. I'm going to pick on Maori. Maori hasn't practiced. He goes and meets with that seller, kind of fumbles it. I come in, I'm practiced, and I crush it. I explain it really easily. I'm beating you, Maori, all day. Sorry, bro. It's your fault, right? <laughs> it's your fault that you weren't prepared, right? So... Yep. Yeah. And if you need help guys, and that's the other thing, remember, like you can lean on us for help. If you're like, Hey, Enrique, I want to sit down with you and role play this part with you, Jason, whoever, like I'd be more than happy to sit down with you. Right. But I'm not going to chase you down to tell you to practice your scripts. Like that's your responsibility. Right. It's the other way around. Hey, I want to practice this. Do you have 15 minutes with me? So I can just practice this on you. All day long, I will make time for you, right? But not the other way around, right? I can't I can't want it more than you do. You have to want it, right? That's all I got, guys. Let's give it up.